What's up, everyone? Welcome to my corner of the internet. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is Crossover Commerce, presented by Ping Pong Payments, the leading global payments provider helping sellers keep more of their hard-earned money. Hey everyone, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Crossover Commerce Live. My name is Ryan Kramer and this is my corner of the internet where I bring the best and brightest experts in the Amazon and e-commerce industry. If you're new to the show or if you're returning again for another episode, welcome back. Welcome to the show. Again, we want to get uh, our guests' insights and expertise on the most important aspects of selling online. That's what this show is about getting people on this show to who have walked the walk that can also talk the talk and help you scale your business, your brand, your service to the next level. That being said, if you're new to the show and you're not familiar with who our presenting sponsor is, we're presented by Ping Pong Payments. What is Ping Pong Payments? Well, it's a cross-border payment service solution that helps people keep more of their hard-earned money. Now, helping over 1 million customers worldwide, Ping Pong has helped transact $90 billion in cross-border payments to date, helping sellers like you save on their margins. Again, that can be anywhere from selling on their uh, selling on multiple different marketplaces, including Amazon, uh, Coupon uh, that we talked about earlier uh, with today, uh, believe it or not, in a different sort of webinar. But then also we uh, can save you on direct-to-consumer eBay, no matter where you might be selling as an entrepreneur, Ping pong payments can actually help you out. Paying out your suppliers, your manufacturers, your VAs, whatever that looks like, make sure you're getting the best rates possible. Don't do the old way of sending money through international wires. Use ping pong. Check out ping pong payments. You can sign for free today. Go ahead and check out that link in the comments or the show notes below if you're listening to us. And again, if you're not watching to us live uh, or and you happen to be listening to us on the podcast version, thanks for listening in. But if you happen to be joining us live, you can actually actually ask your questions to myself or the guest as well. Just go ahead and type in the comment section. Let us know where you're listening from. Let us know your questions that you might have for either one of us, and we'll make sure we get those answered today. That being said, this is episode 149. We are talking with uh, talking about outsourcing your seller central task. Again, not so, uh, it doesn't seem so, uh, omin- it seems somewhat ominous, but seller central tasks obviously can be anything from uh, making sure you're optimized in different capacities, making sure that you're not missing notifications, but we'll get into the weeds of it all. It might be daunting once you first get into seller central, but you want to make sure, as we've always said on the show, time is money. And when you're spending time doing mundane tasks, like in seller central might be, it's time away that you can spend building your business. So that being said, we're going to be talking with our guest today, John Cavendish of Seller Candy. Seller Candy um, is actually an agency level with security practices and deep knowledge of knowledgeable staff, helping people grow their businesses, helping get rid of that waste of time um, and help deal with seller support issues. John actually has been um, experienced owning and overseeing millions in sales on Amazon and his own brands have led him to his full service agency Seller Candy, again, uh, probably one of the greatest last names I've ever heard of, one of the most proper names, Cavendish, but also uh, the the sweetness that he brings to doing tasks like this is by far and away one of the best things you could probably do for your business. So with that being said, I want to bring on John Cavendish of Seller Candy. John, welcome to Crossover Commerce. Thanks for the amazing uh, intro, uh, Ryan, and a uh, very <laughs> sweet intro. Well, I, I was gonna say, look at you, oh, pa- the puns back and forth already. I love it. Yeah. So, so uh, John, I, I only alluded to a little bit of your background. Again, I like to say, as friends of the show, I give a snapshot of what it's like. You are there's so much to unpack with your bio. You're a seller now. You're an agency owner. You've been in the space quite a long time. What, mm. what what's kind of that? Let, let's get a, a little bit more in depth of your background. How did you get to where we are today, John? Uh, my life story. From, yeah, from summed, summed up as best you can, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I live in Vietnam right now, so uh, we're a completely location-dependent team. Our team's based between Vietnam, the Philippines, and to be honest, you know, and the West as well. Um, and I ended up here because I started an Amazon business. I had the same dream that many Amazon sellers had back in 2015, or late 2014, early 2015, and started an Amazon business. 
and it gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. I traveled the world, I made money, I met groups of really cool, interesting people. But about three years into it, I didn't really have any meaning from what I was doing. I felt very much like I was just selling products because I wasn't selling anything I really believed in. I wasn't building it was a transactional. Cool brand. Very transactional, yeah. Okay. And I did a lot of Tony Robbins and personal development, and I wanted to build a business that had impact. And that became a full service agency, and that agency morphed into Seller Candy. And as you said, Seller Candy, what we do is we take away the stress from dealing with Amazon seller support. We just take anything, anytime you'd ever have to communicate with seller support, we take it from you. You just give us the outcome, and our team does whatever it takes to get to the actual result you were trying to go for when you first raised the case. Not like, not whatever the 12 templates and phone calls goes between you and that and that point. Amazing. So uh, I guess first and foremost, why seller candy? Where, what's the name come from? What's the, yeah, where, where does that come from? What's the story behind it? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, we, we kind of think of ourselves as doing bite-sized tasks. So we said tasks in the intro, but really what they are is just bite-sized little things and outcomes. So seller sure. and then candy is, you know, make your life sweet. Our team are candies and uh, the little bite-sized tasks. Is that how we, is that what you call your employees as little candies and, and whatnot? I call them little candies. <laughs> well, hey, that, to each your own, right? Like you have different, uh, I have no idea what we call uh, maybe pongers for ping pong. I'm not really sure. There, there's a lot of different things we can have fun there. Uh, super fascinating uh, background, but you were a seller. So you, you got to know all the nuances of uh, probably PPC. You got to know product listings. You got to do, do sourcing. You got to have your hand in a little bit of everything. So why why get into something as stressful as frustrating as dark as seller support like why why get into this industry Let, let's start let's let's start rip the band-aid off why are we getting into such a dark space on amazon oh because you follow the pain don't you like this is the worst part well for me it was one of the worst parts of dealing having an amazon business is actually trying to get things done on seller central like the, you know, the bit that adds value to your business. Well, I think adds value to an Amazon business is, you know, sourcing the products, differentiating PPC strategy, doing PR outside of your platform, not spending, you know, an hour or two a day, either arguing with seller support or never getting to the outcome that we're actually going for. Um, and yeah, and I've we've built a team of amazing people who I love working with, who, who can do that without. How big is the team now? How big is the team? As of this week, I think 26 or 27. Okay. Um, so still growing very much in the growing. growth phase, I'm assuming. Yeah, okay. we're growing. Uh, we grew, yeah, we're growing like 20% a month at the moment. Wow. So this is something that you saw as a niche. And I know we've actually had a lot of people who this is this is actually something, especially going in Q4, we had an episode earlier on the podcast this week of why now's the time to start prepping and preparing yourself for what potentially could come down the line. 2020 was a really big uh kind of feeling your way out what what the world kind of transitioned to 2021 is dealing with the results of all of that what has been the biggest kind of the result of coming through this two-year processes of both growth on amazon and e-commerce platforms but also trying to understand and go through all these growth pains if that makes sense hmm. Yeah, so we the way we describe ourselves is we're like the cross between experts and assistants. So our clients come to us and they tell us about all these pains, and then we try and help them out. You know, we don't mm -hmm. provide full level agency consultancy, but we will do whatever it takes to, you know, take them from their problem and their pain to the solution. So you know, we talk to people about you know having issues with shipments, having issues with freight forwarders, IPI scores, Amazon's crazy inventory limits right now, like we're doing whatever we can to support. So it's really a lot of conversations, like from the external clients, a lot of conversations, like how we can help them. And then from our team side, it's just how do we keep maintaining an amazingly high quality service while growing so quickly? And that's thanks to really our amazing team and the fact we hire ex-seller support agents who are like super experienced and ex-seller VAs who you know have been around the block for two to five years. Is it still one of those spaces that you feel that there's no consistency. Uh, I know lots of people who talk in the seller support side of things. Hmm. It, there seems to be no standard operating procedure or SOP when it comes to the matter. How are you and your team able to kind of go through, again, let's muddle through the water. How do we, how do we find the right person to resolve issues when it can be 
it could stem from a number of different things like suspended ASINs. We can talk about, uh, you know, your product listing that are flagged for, um, you know, terms of, you know, for some reason or another, their files got hijacked or um, there might be a keyword that was changed by someone else or some, mm -hmm. something along the lines where sellers may not even understand that they have to pay attention to these notifications. You have to come in and almost preemptively fix it or fix something that was that was already festering from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we do. Um, so for your first point about not having processes, it's almost like Amazon has too many processes. They just have this, they have this tool called workflow in the back end right. of seller support. And these guys, all they're allowed to do now, the seller support agents, which is why you get so many terrible templates, is they're only allowed to copy and paste from workflow into the back of your account. So that's the reason we've hired so many amazing people is because they don't want to do that anymore. Like who, who wants to not help people by copying and pasting things from one place to another, but if they do go above and beyond, you know, they get like slapped on the wrist. So, you know, that's why they want to come work for us. Um, but to dive a bit into how we would actually solve the issue, um, we try not to talk to Amazon as much as possible. Like, you know, talking to Amazon gets you into this like never ending cycle of, you know, sure. Template. Yeah. You, right. Back and forth. And they might have their eyeballs on you to dive in deeper into potentially something that doesn't need to be looked at. Right. It's not for a fact of you have something wrong. You just don't want to be caught up in all this review from their internal processes. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you look what the issue is, you try and find it. If you can't figure out what it is, you raise a case about it. But at the same time, you look at the listings, you download your category listing report. Um, you, you sanitize your listing and then you clean it up. So, sorry, I went through that in about hundred miles an hour. That's okay. Let's break it down. Yeah. So break it down. You want to solve most suspension issues. Um, first thing you do to solve a suspension issue is you get Amazon to enable your category listing report in the back end. So you have to raise a case to Amazon and it's a special report that's only available for seven days once you ask them to enable it. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to download a flat file of all of your listings. So even mm -hmm. if Amazon suspended it, you can update the content. Okay. Um, and then once you can update the content, you can go into the back into the flat file, remove all the things because usually it's been suspended because you've said something wrong or there's something wrong with the listing. Um, you sanitize it, you remove all the potential things that could be wrong. You re-upload it um, to, the, to the platform. And then you call up Amazon and tell them you've, you've uploaded a new flat file. They refresh the system and your listings back if, if it if it was down for you know for one of the many rich things that could be wrong with your listing I make mean, it seem so simple is it is it that quick of a turnaround in processes of this sounds like this something in theory should take maybe an hour or so like once you're updated appropriately you flag what it ever what it should be instead of their irrelevant irrelevant keyword i should say excuse me um and then trying to figure out what's that thing that's setting off the bot that's flagged your your hmm. listing or your ASIN. So that being said, how long are we talking before something like this can potentially get resolved? It really depends on Amazon. Um, sure. We would get this done as our team, like same day. So that okay. would happen same day. Um, we'd call up uh, in that day as well, and then spend two hours on the phone with Amazon potentially, because uh, you will go around in circles. But if you've uploaded the flat file, you can always get Amazon to refresh the listing and see the upload. Because the main problem with Amazon is they don't, you know, if you ask them to upload, update something on your listing, they'll send you around five different departments in circles. So to avoid that, you do the upload. Um, but, you know, you might need to do this three times. So sometimes it's next day and you get it back immediately. And sometimes it's a week and, you know, we're every day pushing the same process. But more often than not, our team are, I think, the fastest out there at getting listings back up, especially because we're working with our clients long, like continu continuously and always in their account. Like we don't have to go back and forth. So why would, why would somebody need somebody of your capacity with the speed? Is it just because outsourcing this task is going to save you not just time, but also money? Well, what's kind of the, do you, can you give us like a best case scenario of mm. if I'm doing it myself, you know, I'm a smart person. I like to think I can figure this out, but yeah. what, what are those kinds of pros and cons, if you will, of like working with an agency to outsource this kind of while it's going on in the background, what, what, mm. what can I be working on in theory? Well, what I think, I mean, what I think our service gives is mental space. So like we have, like a, we, have a, we have a portal, um, you know, we have a communication portal where you log in and you talk with our agents two ways. So you log into your portal for five minutes a day, 
you raise a lot, you raise all the outcomes that you want for your business, and then you don't need to do anything else. You can consider it done. So anything mm -hmm. that you were thinking I had to do today that involves dealing with seller support, updating something, following up on something, just give it to us. Um, check it five minutes a day. You get pinged by our email if we respond to you in the portal. Um, you can submit as many things as you want, an unlimited number of things per month. And based on the package you're paying us for, you get a certain number of simultaneous tasks being worked on. So it might be two, it might be three, it might be four, but it means that you can just leave us pushing through all your tasks. You can upload 10 at a time. And uh, that's how you get on with your business and spend time, you know, growing it, PPC, being on the beach, hanging out with your dog, whatever That'd you want. That'd be nice. Well, yeah, we, we kind of alluded to kind of the, the grim parts of what might be needed for an agency like yours. What, what, what are those hidden things that people may not always understand? For example, if I'm a seller coming to you, I'm like, what else, what other things may I not think about that can be just like taken off my plate? Ultimately, the more that's off my plate, mm. that is almost easy. We call them, uh, MWAs, minimum wage activities, right? Like not the fact that seller candy's minimum wage, but it's, time the concept is taking tasks for example of like uploading or refreshing or any sort of capacity in something i can spend my time this is what ping pong does really well right is like making sure that you have all of your dashboards in one area or all your income in one area that's what we do best um and effectively how how is seller candy taking some of those mundane tasks off your plate like what else would we be missing maybe um, We've got a really cool menu of services, plug the website that people can download and see all the stuff that we can do. Sure. Uh, but it's basically anything you can argue with seller support about. Um, some of the other stuff that we can do, which is not so common, but we're really, really good at, we can help with inventory projection. So actually, you know, pushing, you know, helping you project between your warehouse, your 3PL and your supplier, make you a nice spreadsheet, update it weekly, send it over to you. Um, with smaller stuff, usually with smaller sellers, you know, anyone from... 20 to 100k a month, um, smaller on the on the on the grand scheme of things. And then we bigger sellers like you know 500 to a million dollars a month. We tend to do their super complicated, you know, clench, you know you clench when you delete your 200 uh, 200 unit a day ASIN, and you want someone to hold your hand to make sure that uh, you deliver it. You know you don't mess things up. Okay, so um, yeah, that makes sense. Go ahead. Sorry, and also we do stuff like we do reimbursements. So we've got rev our revenue recovery service. Uh, what we do there is we do, you know, similar to other reimbursement services, but being that we're super ingrained into your account, uh, things like uh, inbound shipments, things where we need you to provide information, we're a lot better at getting the information out of you. We help, you know, we kind of help you manage yourself in getting money back from inbound shipments, sending us the data, sending us the information, because, you know, we have a relationship with our clients. So, you know, our goal is to create raving fans. And we do that by like, super positive communication. We're always there. We're always there to support. We're very, re we're very proactive in getting back to you. And we just want to be there to make, you know, ecstatic clients. You're like a safety blanket or a safety net, if you will, of someone who, who can rely on, um, you know, just to be there to support you through like the difficult times because that's entrepreneurs. And for the listeners out there listening to this, they're like, that's always good to know that I can have maybe some sort of backup in case I need to have that support. So that being said, what, what's kind of the most would be, what's a commonality that you're seeing more today's as Amazon continues to have inflow of uh, both the successes, but also the problems that most people encounter, what are those intricate like issues that you're seeing more and more trending now? There's so, I mean, there's so many issues on there all the time with Amazon. There's something standing um, out more than more than not than that you maybe not used to see as much, but now is becoming more of a, uh, more aware of. If that makes sense. I mean, the biggest thing that is that Amazon support is getting worse. You know, like they're getting slow. They're getting slower to respond. They they take more more tries to fix to fix things than they used to. So it's more work for us, but that's a, mm -hmm. that's a good thing, I guess. Um, but it just means that we're going back and forth so many times to fix things sometimes and so many calls. Um, they're getting more and more put into the box, their support team, and less able to help us get through things. Because at the end of the day, we are representing you and we're pushing super hard to get to the, the result. Um, also storage. I mean, I, I, everyone's got an issue with storage right now. It's the worst thing ever. Um, inventory limits. In, inventory limits, yeah. Account limits is just terrible. People with over 700 IPI scores inventory performance scores, which is a great number, getting limited to a month's worth of inventory. 
So what, if you have to see these trends, like you're a data person, it sounds like if you had to, if you had to put on your hat of where this trend inevitably is going to go, is that concerning for you as a, as a person who's ingrained in this community or what are you, what are you bracing your clients for maybe for worst case scenario? Uh, well, I mean, we're telling everyone to get 3PL. Uh, you know, it's Amazon's, you know, it's always fun, isn't it? There's always something new happening. It's always something crazy going on. So I kind of think that we, we brief them for what might happen and then we just support them for whatever, whatever happens, you know, something random pops up. Um, we, we fix it. Awesome. Something Amazing. So, yeah. So actually, sorry, there's lots of people, uh, this must be, uh, I like the fact that people are putting lots of different candies in the comments. So I appreciate it. We we're seeing these as they're coming through. So people are watching us live. Uh, we have, we actually do have a question, uh, from Daniel. Daniel asked uh, for you, John, how is seller candy reimbursements better than just using, uh, helium 10 or any other software or service out there? That's a great question, Daniel. Um, what would, what would be those distinguishing factors, Daniel? I know, or excuse me, John, I know you mentioned you're, you're familiar with the the client and their account. Is that really what stands out? What stands out is that we have our own process. So we download all the data and then we have like 14 different types of reimbursements that we go through. Um, and that we only charge based on success for, for reimbursements. So the cool thing is, you know, if, if you want to see if we're any better, you can just give us a go. If you've already run them yourself, just say, oh, give us a go and see if we can get more for you, uh, because we will be able to. Um, we also have some other cool stuff. Like, did you know that Amazon actually loses maybe about 5% of your the revenue they lose in fulfillment center transfer? So as they're transferring between one and another fulfillment center, it literally falls, the back of, falls off the back of a truck or they lose it. So... Um, we have, we have a proprietary process where we download all of the inventory reports, put them through a system, and then we can match the goods leaving one warehouse and arriving in the next warehouse. So this would be if Amazon needs to, all my goods are being shipped to a fulfillment center in the West Coast, they're going to start distributing closer to East Coast, potentially South, Midwest. Again, depending on where marketplace you're selling in, that's when you're telling people that they're losing, actually losing up to 5% of their, their truckload, if you will, or people's uh, inventory? 5% of the total reimbursements. So we say- Oh, total so, reimbursement, I'm sorry. So a good, a good metric for Daniel actually would be how much money you're getting back per month. And we should say you should be getting between one and 1.5% 1 on average back of your total revenue per month. So doing 100K a month, you should be getting between, uh, when you do when you raise it, you should be getting about one and a half thousand dollars, one to one and a half thousand dollars back. If you're getting less than that, then then talk to us. Right. So you're, you're saying that that's kind of your benchmark that you're shooting for, but that's consistent because I, I guess I should be following around an Amazon truck and just follow them because you said there's going to be lost inventory. <laughs> like, how is this happening? Like, are, are you, I'm, I'm kind of curious too. Is there a reason, rhyme or reason why that's happening? Is, is it just a breakage or it gets mislabeled or it doesn't go to the right warehouse? Like wh where is, where's the miscommunication amongst Amazon? You would think that they would share up those, those kind of processes a little bit, more efficiently um, considering. I mean, that's that's a small amount mislaid because if it's only 5% of that, of that one if that uh, one and a half percent, it's still quite a small amount. Uh, but the main stuff is the stuff they're losing in the warehouse. It's like warehouse lost, warehouse damage, just stuff that disappears when they're moving it around. Like that is a huge amount, especially if you've never done, you've never run proper reimbursements and had a professional team do it. There's a lot of money being left on the table in that. So how, so at what point is Amazon and I get this, this is something that I personally know the answer, but a lot of people might want to understand like Daniel, um, at what point is Amazon responsible for your, your inventory? At what point is, is it on them for reimbursements potentially to happen? Is it once it hits their warehouse or is it at what, at what section, you know, in the, in the logistics chain is Amazon responsible for your goods? Well, if you can prove it, then they're responsible from the time they pick up. Uh, they pick up from your supplier's warehouse if you're using their um, partner carrier. So, you know, from that point, you know, do you then have inbound and lost inbound? So if they haven't checked in everything that left from your 3PL to go into Amazon or your freight forwarders to go into Amazon, you can claim that. And then every point forward from that. So from there into the warehouse, where it disappears in the warehouse, on the way to the customer, when the customer doesn't return it, once they've asked for a refund, they're responsible. So there's like, we've, we've got a list of like 14 different points that they can lose your inventory. 
um, or lose, sorry, they can lose your money. And then we go back and we look at each one of those 14 different points. Interesting. Is there a category that a seller should be? And again, Daniel, thank you so much for the question. If you have another one or anyone who's watching this live, if you're listening to this, you can obviously submit this in the comment section on both podcast channels as well as the social media channels. A uh, great question right there. But John, my question to you is, does it actually go as deep as what category you might be in to determine mm -hmm. how big of a uh, reimbursement you might get? Because I think that's that's something a seller should always keep in the back of mind. If I'm in category XYZ, there actually might be a higher threshold of returns um, because of breakage, because of lost inventory, like you said, in warehouse. If you're selling a fridge, like that, that's something hard to get lost, right? But mm -hmm. it might be an intricate, um, it might get damaged or anything along the ways. Um, is there a category that we should be looking out for? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, some consumables aren't, aren't eligible for reimbursement. So that would be one you'd maybe have lower reimbursements in. Okay. So food um, or supplements or anything you put in the body or put on the body. Um, it depends on the, it depends on the specific item actually. So you'd have to look into it. Sure. Um, I had an idea. Yeah. The, the other thing is categories, like you really keep an eye on your categories because some categories have lower referral fees than others. And if Amazon's miscategorized you, then you can claim back a huge amount of money in referral fees. So mm -hmm. just making sure whether you're in a, you know, 15% category, an 8% category, a 20% category, um, make sure you're in the right category. Cause that is just money evaporating out of your, out of your wallet. Right. And for the people who don't know how back, how far back this can go for reimbursements, the Amazon just updated their terms, right? So how, how far back can, uh, a seller go to reimburse or claim reimbursement for damaged goods or anything like that. Is there, there a time frame or a time window when, uh, for example, statute of limitation, like what, what's our statute of limitation for broken or, uh, lost or whatever Amazon goods, um, mm. that might, we can get reimbursements for. Yes. Yeah, so it depends on the type. So certain things, 18 months, uh, like I think lost inbounds, 18 months, uh, but other things are between uh, nine months, six months and 90 days. So it really depends on the type of reimbursement. We go back up to 18 months on the ones that we can go back to, and then we go back as far as we can on everything else. And then we just stay up to date with it, with the clients that use that service from us. Where, where is the most of the reimbursements coming from? Is there like a category breakdown? Yeah. Inventory adjustment, lost inventory, inventory adjustment. in the warehouse, and lost inventory in the warehouse. So instead of having a hundred units on hand, there's 96 or something yeah, like Amazon that. There's just a lot. Yeah. Okay. Basically. So there's like a gold mine, basically just an inventory of lost goods, basically that no one's found yet. It's just out there. So mm -hmm. what happens? I guess, I guess my question is what if Amazon finds that inventory, do they reapply it to your account or what happens to something where it's already been reimbursed for that lost, lost or stolen good or whatever it might be. How, what happens to it? If they theoretically find it, like mm -hmm. it's just a box somewhere, like there's still physicality to it and they're looking at it, it's not in their system anymore. What happens to it? Do you um, know? Yes, yeah, so they credit, because if it's got your uh, FNSKU on it, they credit it back to your inventory. So they okay. credit back to your inventory and then they, they reverse their reimbursement to you. Okay. So they so, just charge it to your account again. Okay, so then they would take back the money that they reimbursed you for? Yeah. So we have, we have, a, <laughs> so we have, nice a, of we have a report for this. So we issue it with our clients every okay. month. It shows them what we refunded, what they refunded themselves and what Amazon refunded. And then all of the adjustments that they've then back back charged against those, each one of them. So it makes it really easy for our clients to see. I mean, this is just part of our service. Like this is just the, the icing right. on the cake, our real service, which is helping people to, you know, free up their time from Seller Central. And this is just Seller Candies turning into a platform. So, you know, what we do is we do everything that you don't want to do in your Amazon account, dealing with numbers, dealing with seller support in the future, dealing with customer service like dealing with the stuff which doesn't add value to the business um, at a basic level. Right. Is there a point where you would just become a seller county? Do you envision becoming just a full service, like run of business agency where you have sellers, you just take over entire end to end. Is that where you eventually see this mm. continuing? No, uh, actually, no. Um, I see us as a platform to support anybody. So we support sellers, we support online arbitrage sellers, private label sellers, agencies, aggregators. Uh, one of our aggregator clients just raised $165 million today. So it's crazy. Oh, I know two of them that raised money today and they're both located in the United Kingdom. So yeah, uh, shout out to uh, Oslam or, uh, or excuse me, Olsum, 
or uh, I'm gonna what's the other one? Hold on, uh, Heroes. Those are the two. So it's one or the oh, other. It's one of them. I, I won't uh, say if you're under NDA, I, I can guess for you. No, so we're, not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not. We're not. We're not. We're not NDA. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, we we support agencies, aggregators. Like I don't want to do full service. We don't do PPC. We don't do content creation. We don't do strategy. And the okay. reason for that is that I want to work with everybody, and I want to help everybody. You know, agencies and aggregators have the same issues that sellers do, which is this work sucks expensive time, and and mental capacity and money. And we, we, we want to help everybody. Mm -hmm. So does this growth happen just on Amazon or are we, are you looking to get more into different marketplaces, right? Amazon's only a piece of the puzzle as large as it is. There's uh, expansion into different marketplaces here domestically. You see a lot of people going into Walmart, um, even different marketplaces such as like Etsy, uh, all, all these different types of platforms. But again, once you look at internationally, there's a, bunch of different ones out there. Is it possible for you to grow, support those services or in, in their dashboard? Uh, eventually, I, I see okay. it that we could be eventually there. I mean, Amazon's got such a high ceiling for us. You know, I think we could, um, you know, we could be 100x bigger than we are now before we need before we go outside Amazon, it really depends on on our growth path as a business over the next, you know, two to five years. Okay, so Again, why are you are you still selling on the side, John, or you have completely removed yourself from the selling capacity? I sold like the majority share in my business. I still have a, a share in an Amazon business, but I don't have anything to do with it anymore. Okay. So with that being said, would you ever get back into selling or is it something that you just want to get your hands in or you've just removed yourself? Like you said, you, you saw it as just a transactional thing. Is that where you see a lot of being in the space myself? So my background comes in selling direct to consumer, um, so I had to build a brand, but also on different kinds of platforms through a uh, performance marketing, then you get into the software side, but, and now I'm, fin I'm in FinTech, but I've seen this transition for sellers, right? Like, I think it's, I'm curious what your thoughts are from being entrepreneurs and the mindset of, I want to grow something business wise or a brand, then they teach other people how to do it or they develop their own service. And there, there's this like natural trans transition into different kinds of the industry. Is that something that you're just, you're happy with the service side or is there other things out there you would like have fascinated you personally or your company to get into? Does that make sense? That's kind of yeah, a personalized no, 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 question, no, no. but I want to make sure. That's a great question. Um, I mean, my, my belief after doing so many different, like, you know, I different hustles and different, different, I guess I call them hustles, but different businesses. Um, you know, that weren't really, weren't traditional businesses. They were great ways of making money at the time, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like a long-term vision. And I'm like a big believer that like focus is power, especially through, you know, through growth and really like holding on to something and understanding where it's going and steering the ship. And, you know, I'm not doing anything else. Like I'm doing seller candy. Um, we're going to take seller candy as far as it can go and, you know, really build it into a, you know, a known brand. Right. And you know, I wouldn't have any time or focus to do anything else. To there's only one of there's only one John Cavendish. But what, so with that being said, is it is it the focus on just U.S. market or where's the international growth and support? Are you guys supporting other Amazon marketplaces specifically right now, or do you support all of them? Yeah, we support we support almost all of them. We support uh, USA, Europe, and Australia. Mm -hmm. um, because they're easy, they're easy, you know, and uh, sorry, USA, we do North America, Europe and Australia. Uh, so we do NARF as well. And also, uh, also whether you're selling in Mexico or Canada. Um, so do you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to, just going to say like all of these markets are massive, you know, have still have massive amounts of, uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. I, I would say uh, my biggest thing, and I think you see this too, is the potential aspect of growing on Amazon, right? You don't see any, the, the ceiling coming anytime soon, even in the US marketplace, which is the number one Amazon marketplace. So for the sake of my listener and, and our audience watching or listening today, mm. I'm curious to you, since you work in the capacity of seeing where the growth is, where lots of different sellers are onboarding, where they want to grow their business, what is your outlook on certain marketplaces in the Amazon ecosystem? Is mm. there one you have your eye on, uh, maybe not as trendy as the other ones, or do you feel like it's the traditional United States marketplace? Then you have Europe or UK. Germany is one A. 
right there, or two A, I should say. Then you have Japan, Australia, Canada. You have those are kind of like your next tier of businesses. Where what's in your mind the next growth potential behind the United States, if you think? think Or maybe not maybe in front of the United States, yeah. No, I mean, I, I like the United States, but it's it's all about strategy, like in whatever your strategy is for your business. So, you know, I still think you want to grow something really quick, US. Uh, it has to be the right fit, oh, you know, probably oversized and weird and in some weird category, um, unsexy product, or an actual brand and differentiated. Um, or you could go for the strategy of going for Europe. And, you know, Italy is a great market. France is a great market. You could go for those markets because nobody concentrates on them. And that's what we did you know, four years ago, and they're still great markets now. People, are, We still have people selling a lot of money in those markets. Um, so I think it's like figuring out the strategy first and then not just chasing the shiny object, but knowing like, I'm going to go here. I'm going to put this much money in this. This is where we're going to rank. This is the competition. This is how many reviews we need to get. This is how we're going to do it. You know, and having a, a plan of to execute. For, for those different marketplaces. Oh, yeah, ex exactly. And to that point, I think people... You said you have to understand why that marketplace makes sense for you. Is Amazon Seller Central different from marketplace to marketplace, or is that something that that's kind of why there's another pro to you? Is because they're a little bit different. They're more nuanced. It's harder to understand. What might be in one dashboard might not be in the other, so on and so forth. Is there is that why there's another pro to working with a business like yours? I mean, the dashboards are pretty much the same. You just have eight times as many issues in Europe because you've got eight marketplaces to update uh, through the same account. They're just, a, they're just a drop down menu. Um, lots of, but you have lots of issues if you've got variations with your variations splitting out and jumping out randomly in one marketplace. And then that's the sort of stuff we fix. You know, you've got a variation. A, one color's jumped out in France for some reason. I don't know why. Then they say, oh, sell a candy. Can you just figure out why and then sort it out for us? And we go, okay. So that's an hour of time saved trying to figure out what it is, create a flat file, upload the flat file 10 times, do it wrong and get it right again uh, from the client side. What's the most, what's the thing that's surprised you the most by operating a service-based industry? Oh, after running an Amazon business? Yeah. Oh, like actually running a business with staff, you know, actually how to run a real business with sales and marketing and delivery and culture and managing people and, yeah, running a building a real business. Not I was gonna say not, Amazon business is a real business. You make you make you do amazing with it. But you do a lot on your own. Yeah. Yeah, you do a lot on your own, and it's a lot of automated stuff, which is awesome. Um, yeah, growing a a business where we had to think of all of it. That's been my biggest wake up call from running an agency. Um, from dealing with you know having maybe a thousand conversations with Amazon sellers in the last year, I guess. So, yeah, it's just connecting with amazing people. I guess mm -hmm. there's just so many cool people out there who are trying to make trying to make money or already are making money, and they're doing some really cool stuff on the Amazon platform. With um, that as kind of your north star, if you will, or that that's your experience in your onboarding new clients. What's something that you wish a new potential client would ask you? I'm always curious. Is there something that you you think that there's lack in education or audience out there before they come with you, what's one thing that you wish they would, you know, make prevalent upfront with you, whether it's, you know, my business is doing really well when it, you look into the numbers and that's not the case, or you have issues with product or whatnot that maybe alleviate a headache at the beginning rather than, you know, have to go through it a month or two down the road. Um, I mean, we don't judge. We, you know, we, we get there. We're like, all right. I get well, that. We'll... I get this. I get this concept. Yeah, you're not a judgy person. It doesn't seem like. Uh, we don't. You know, <laughs> we just figure it out. We figure it out. There's always, especially when someone comes to us. There's, oh, there's not much stuff for you to do. But I suppose that's the main thing that everyone always says. There's not going to be that much for you to do. And then we we do an audit of everyone's account when we start and give them a list of like 30 things for us to do. Because um, I mean, that's how we how we show the value in our service. And you know, everyone has problems. Everyone comes to us like has an issue. We're like, well, okay. It's fine. We'll figure it out. Um, just get on board and we'll, we'll sort it out. And then a week later, hopefully, they're a raving fan. We figured everything out. And then they're a client for life. You know, we've still got 80% of the clients we've ever worked with. And it's a month-to-month -month contract. What's the most impressive thing that you've learned 
from your clients then on the flip side? Like, is there something that stands out to you that you've learned from them doing an operating businesses? Like they're like, no, John, this is actually how it's supposed to go. Like they are the ones teaching you instead of you informing and helping them. Uh, I've learned definitely stuff from the aggregator space, how they work. Um, because the Amazon space, you know, I was a seller for four years. So I, right. I think I understand roughly how that works. Um, but from the, yeah, from the aggregator space, it's super interesting. Like seeing how they operate, what they do, how they're structuring their teams, uh, all the different people that we're talking to in their teams. Yeah, it's very interesting. But I don't, so I don't know what the specific thing would be. Right. Well, well, with that trend, I'm always curious because we've had on the show uh, tomorrow, actually, I'll be uh, speaking with one of them uh, based in Germany, uh, their seller X. With that being said, lots of people understand that there's lots of people raising money. We alluded to earlier in this podcast. Um, there's just lots of different pros and cons to watching what they're doing, right? there. There's more cropping up. There's more businesses that are coming to market. What's your perception of the market in itself? Is this something you wish that was around when you were selling that you were like, I can exit my business. I'll just sell one of them instead of like you said, holding on to shares uh, with your current business. Um, well, what's kind of your take on the industry itself? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? Like uh, compared to how things were two years ago, how aggressive everyone is on acquisition. Like three of our clients got acquired in the last six months. Um, and my, you know, my friends have sold to different aggregators. Um, so it's been interesting to see it happen. I mean, I think there's always been a, a market to buy and sell these businesses, but it's just having the aggregators here has made it so easy or so much more straightforward to sell it. For me, the reason I, I hesitated was because I, I wasn't sure how I'd answer this question about like the whole economy in general, like, uh, what does it mean for the entire economy? You know, like the fact that house prices are going up so quickly, stock markets going up so quickly, multiples on these businesses have gone up like what one or two X added in the last six months. Like, I don't know. Are you thinking the inflation of, of how you evaluate businesses? You, you, that's what it sounds like you're alluding to. Is it, is there a, a bubble that you think, or more of a, this is going to continue to rise. And you think just based on value of audiences, more consumers are buying online. Amazon's the number one marketplace in the world, uh, continuing to grow adoptive wise across multiple different marketplaces. It's only going to continue to skyrocket. Maybe not as many that continue to enter the market as quickly as they have been, but more of a, Hey, I'm going to operate multiple hundreds of businesses. Um, if you want to exit it, we can operate effect effectively, efficiently and more, you know, with more capital than what you as an individual can at any given point, let us take what you've take, let us take the sapling or the seed that you've planted and let's grow it into a redwood and watch it continue to be around for a long time. Is that, is that what more you've seen? Well, I mean, the foot, I, I have no idea. Or expect, <laughs> or like maybe hope, I've, hope, hope for. I mean, let's I think like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what I hope for because everything's so overheat. If something, if everything continues to go up, it has to go down in order to get to the point where it's reset again. Profitable, right? Yeah. So, actually, you know, I, you know, I'm not smart. I'm not smart enough to have an answer for that. To be honest, I think just like we keep our heads down, uh, grow the business, get work done, help people, and whatever happens, as long as we're adding enough value, we're we're gonna be all right, and so will everyone else. As long as the business model is set on a on good principles. Well, before we get to the top of the hour, my question for you is, as we go into Q3 and Q4, what tips do you have for sellers out there, whether working for you or not? How can we, how can we best go into one of the busiest times of the year traditionally? Mm -hmm. um, is there any, anything that they need to reevaluate, make sure it's shirt up, protected, um, checked as often as it needs to be? What, what tips can you provide for us in the listener? Um, Inventory planning, obviously. I mean, it's we're getting pretty late now. It's first of September, so hopefully you've all placed your orders. Everyone who's uh, who's watching has placed their orders, and the inventory is coming soon. Um, I, you know, three PLs. If for some reason you don't have a three PL yet, and you think you're going to be okay, get a three PL set up um, just as a as a backup. Have someone there who's there to you know manage overstock and fulfill. 
Um, what are your biggest things for Q4, Ryan? No, it's a good question. Um, we're going to switch it up. So I, I think I think the biggest things would be pertaining to this specifically is being proactive instead of reactive, right? I think a lot of people saw, unfortunately, that you need to protect yourself from worst case scenario, uh, making sure you go through the exercises. And again, I talked about this on a, a past episode of going through the exercise in a worst case scenario. What if someone hijacks your listing and your best selling ASIN goes down? Do you have a fulfilled by merchant listing out there? Do you have a way to have an email maybe ready to be sent off right away or working with a company like Seller Candy to be ready for those kinds of instances where if it's being shut down around, you know, the highlight of Q4 and you you don't have maybe you're offline for 72 hours, that that could be tens of thousands of dollars, depending on who as a brand you are. And obviously, um, you know, the effectiveness of, you know, what we can do for the rest of the year. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of me personally, I think that you'll continue to see not just huge peaks and valleys of like prime day, for example, or, um, black Friday or cyber Monday, those start to become more of a plot, uh, spread out over a course of a series of time instead of, you know, a few days here and there. So it's always important to, as you said, this is the first of September here in the United States, at least um, going into the second of September uh, overseas, but we're talking about inventory planning, a huge number one thing to be focused and I would say worried about uh, if you can last through stock again, Chinese new year's right after the first of 2021, then you're worried about, um, you know, all these different things that are going to be happening in the APAC region. Again, uh, the Olympics is coming back in six months or five months, five now, months now already. Yeah, right. So that would, that would shut down. Um, I believe it's in Japan, uh, or China, I think. no, China, China winter. Um, so that would be affecting potentially, um, you know, logistics shutdowns again, having training new suppliers, that that's a real big concern for lots of sellers right now. But I think just the having enough inventory, making sure that you can sell if something happens on a listing where you, you're not re solely relying on one leg of your business. We saw that in 2020 when Amazon shut down. Uh, did, yeah, as you probably know, non-essential goods in the United States, people didn't have other options. They, you know, we're out of luck, if you will, for a series of weeks, if not months, but being able to sell on direct to consumer websites, different marketplaces, uh, different worldwide Amazon marketplaces, even you're able to kind of supplement that, that loss, if you will, here in the United States, at least. So making sure that you have a, a kind of a growth plan and how you feel comfortable with, um, because costs are going to continue to rise. I'm assuming for sourcing and logistics, um, having that backup plan if you can't get your goods in time and making sure that you're working with someone who can effectively, if your listing gets shut down for one of many reasons, or uh, you just need tasks, again, time is money. If you need tasks to be taken off your plate, it's always important to have those, you know, working for you instead of against you, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you can like, you know, work on your business, not in your business, not have exactly. to continuously be the person who's like, driving everything forward and it's not solely down to us as solopreneurs. Absolutely. Is there any other uh, trends that you see, John, that maybe are under the radar that aren't as sexy talked about as often as, you know, again, uh, topic X, Y, Z, is there something that you're more fascinated with and you're kind of keeping an eye on whether it's a trend or it's a uh, business model or a service? Is it, is there something out there that has piqued your interest that you want to, kind of watch and maintain and not good eye on? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm trying to think of anything. I mean, the trend I've seen a lot of is uh, automated PPC softwares, but I haven't really used any of them. Um, but everyone seems to be launching one. That's true. Uh, Coming from a software company before this, I, I can attest to. We, we, have, we did build out one of those. <laughs> cool. Um, Yes, I mean I'm, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, maybe should do an, I should do another. I should do a blog post or something and think about what I see in 2022 predictions. 2022. Those are always fun to do, and I've I've certainly done those. Those are those are fun. You can't be held to it because they're just uh they're just thoughts, right? You, you, there's no uh there's no ramifications from it. Uh, we're not 
actually in Amazon is like, this is what we think is going to happen. Uh, but that being said, I, I think um, things I've kept an eye on, I think is super fascinating watch it on the financial side, if you will, of um, you've seen a firm uh, now partner with Amazon, almost a, a trend where it's a firm, the business model is being able to pay in installments instead of all at once. I think it's fascinating to kind of keep an eye on that where higher ticket items now can be financed, if you will, Mm. uh, in three months installments, six months installments. Shopify does something very similar um, to that capacity where you get paid out all at once, but the consumer is paying back in monthly increments. Keeping an eye on that because it might be higher average order values that you can now start to uh, buy larger electronics and higher end uh, fashion items or just large ticket items in general. Now you can start to pay off over time. Again, potentially at a cost, um, again, a percentage or two, uh, but kind of keeping an eye on that, thought that was fascinating that there, there's those financing options, but then also how continuously are people going to be shifting their habits in general? Like as winter comes, are people going to now get comfortable with purchasing grocery and more essential items again back on e-commerce um, instead of more in the summertime. So there's always there's all these different things I'm, I'm curious about as you know the season kind of con- continues to trickle on and the quarter comes to an end and the busiest time of year for lack of a better term is popular. So again, if listener, if you have something that you're looking on or uh, have a trend in mind, go ahead and shoot that in the comment section. But um, before we wrap up, John, what's kind of the as seller candy continues to grow, what are you most excited about as as both a co-founder, as a service provider? What is your focus for the rest of this year? And what do you hope to get right beginning for next year? Oh, I don't know. What I'm most excited about is just continuing to grow as we have and and like impact so many businesses. Like what we've been doing with Seller Candy is like actually inspired me, like our amazing team. I know some of them are watching now, so I want to like say hi to our team. Um, and yeah, it's just been a really amazing experience to work with some really, really cool people and just see where the business goes. Like I'm very excited to, yeah, to continue this journey. Um, the business, you know, I, you know, as a as an Amazon seller previously, I want to be doing the next thing and the next, you know, next product and the next product with even with seller candy. Like when are we going to launch the next part of the service? But I've realized now that we have to take a step back and make sure we scale right and make sure that we, you know, we deliver the right service to our clients. So uh, I'm just excited to to see this, where this journey goes over the next few years. Well, it was pretty sweet to talk with you today. And as always, you know, working with people and talking with people as yourself, you kind of get it, you you see what's coming and being able to help people scale appropriately. Again, taking tasks off their plate um, that might otherwise hinder their businesses is, is super valuable in this, in this day and age. Um, but how, if people want to get in touch with you, the team over at Seller Candy, just connect and kind of go through thoughts and processes. If it makes sense to work with you, um, how, how do people do that? I mean, they can drop me an email. Um, I'm pretty open at the moment still. Uh, I'm actually really busy, but yeah, I can give out my email here and anyone wants to reach out, they can uh, email me Go john ahead. at john at sellercandy.com. Or if you want to chat to somebody on our team about what we actually do, you've gone to the website, there's a live chat there. And if you just type in uh, ping pong in the chat, and it'll ask you for your email, put in your email and our team will, will reach out and talk to you same day. Amazing. Awesome. Well, that, that is something here I'll go ahead and put in the chat. Uh, the website for people, oops, that was a different thing. That was the title of it. For some reason, didn't copy my URL. But real quickly, let me go ahead for the people watching and listening. If you haven't gone to Seller Candy, it's just sellercandy.com. So you can definitely go ahead and check that out. For people who are listening to this, I'll have the link in the show notes as well as John's LinkedIn and contact information as well. So that being said, John, thank you so much for hopping on Crossover Commerce today. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Now I would call you the friend, a friend of our show. Um, so you're more than welcome to help on anytime you have insights or thoughts um, about seller candy and just what you're seeing. We'll have to do a recap of what we're expecting to see in 2022. It's coming yeah, before we know it. Right. So, but I appreciate your time today and hopping on crossover commerce. Thanks for having me, Ryan.
No problem. Have a great one. Awesome. And thank you everyone who is watching and listening to Crossover Commerce today. Again, this is episode 149 of our show. This is the corner of the internet where we talk to the best and brightest experts in the Amazon e-commerce space. If you like what you heard, uh, go ahead and click on that like button or the heart button, however you you deem to give your approval of the episode. Again, John, such a great, uh, amazing company, but also just a great mind in the Amazon e-commerce space. You can check them out at sellercandy.com. Um, but also connect with him on his social profiles on LinkedIn is what we'll point to as well. That being said, this is episode 149 of Crossover Commerce. We have one more live episode later this week. Again, if you miss part portions of this episode, you can go back and watch on our social media profiles on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter, or you can even wait for the audio version to come out on your favorite social or favorite podcast uh, platforms, excuse me. So that being said, We'll catch you guys next time on Crossover Commerce. Take care.